Why, thank you. Is this for me? It's for everyone. It's for everyone. Amen. Good job. So um, I don't know if everybody knows this or not, I, but I asked Jenny's permission to share that uh, three years ago we adopted Jenny. And so we, we got her in kind of in the middle of, cr- of COVID, um, which was a blessing. And I thought that this Bible verse, which was one of the recommended Bible verses for today's theme of hope, was very appropriate because it talks about being adopted into God's family. And uh, just what a beautiful picture it is to have her read that to you this morning. And she has the gift of faith, and she admits that. Um, she knows that. And um, when, we, when we first received her three years ago, she definitely could not have said that or very told you very much about the Bible or what God did for her. But man, she has grown, grown, grown. Uh, both this way and in her knowledge of the word and in her, her, her relationship with Jesus. And that's just been a, a real blessing. I feel like I'm about to get this shirt. All right. So today we are starting a new series called Christ's Gift to You, Christ's Gift to the Church. And I'm excited about this. We have a lot of um, members in our church that are very mature in the faith and have a lot of qualifications and have been in God's word a long time. And, and some of you had said, you know, I'm, I'm ready to preach. I'm ready to you know, be involved and, and give, some, give a message or two. And some of you have not been so quick to say that, but I've asked you anyway, and, and you've agreed, and that's awesome. Um, that's, that's just showing uh, growth. And, and, and so... We're going to be talking about the gifts that Christ gives to us. Now, you can't see the gifts on the floor over here. I, uh, maybe we can relocate that next time. But um, this is Christmas season, right? And I don't know about you, but I don't like waiting until Christmas Eve to tell people how Merry Christmas. I like to tell people Merry Christmas pretty much right after Thanksgiving because everybody's already decorating for Christmas anyway. All right, might as well say Merry Christmas. And yet, time and time again, I get weird looks like, that's not for a long time yet. Like, well, this is the Christmas season. That's why it says that on every wall that you see and every short store you go into, right? At least happy holidays, if nothing else. But remind them for the reason of the season. And so um, Christ has gifts that he has given to his church. And we are going to explore those over the next five weeks, including today, so that we can fully understand and appreciate those gifts And we're going to first look at Ephesians chapter 4. So I need everybody to open up your Bible so we can figure out what God's Word says here. I have the key verse on the screen, but you're going to miss out on the other verses if you don't open up. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 2. I don't see everybody with a Bible or a reading device. I'll just wait a little bit longer. All right, here we go. Starting in verse 2, I'm going to skip around a little bit. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. Bind yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. And that is beautiful. That is just showing the unity of the body of Christ, even across denominational lines, across church boundaries, whatever, that we are one in Christ, with one spirit, one baptism, one communion that we shared today. Amen? We are called to be the body of Christ in this world, and that doesn't just mean Lamp Ministries. But, verse 7, it says, However, he has given each of us, one of us, he has given each one of us a separate gift through the generosity of Christ. Moving ahead to verse 11. Now, these are the gifts of Christ. These are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. 
the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. If you recall, the last time I preached two weeks ago, we talked about how, um, well, we've, we've reiterated we all have a part to play, right? We all have a part in this mission and that we are actually to be priests to one another and to this world, that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, 1 Peter 2.9. Moving down to verse 15. So we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of this body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So, God has given us, Jesus has given us five gifts, it says here in Ephesians 4.11. On the screen, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And their responsibility is to equip people to do God's work, to build up the church, the body of Christ. Amen? So, Something in this box is a gift, well, sort of, represents a gift from Jesus. Now, you might be saying that, um, well, I don't feel like an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, or a teacher, or a pastor. But certainly you can agree with me that we've all been given spiritual gifts, right? We've all been given spiritual gifts that God equips us with in order to benefit the body of Christ. And so I'm going to be proposing to you this week and over the next five weeks that all of those spiritual gifts can be grouped together in one of these five categories, which we call the fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, whatever order comes to mind is fine. And so we're going to be examining how not only does God give us the gift of a person who operates in that role, one of those five-fold ministries, such as Pastor Curtis, right? Um, but also, all of us have been given gifts that contribute to one of these areas of the five-fold ministry, okay? Either as an apostle or apostolic gifts, prophetic gifts, pastoral gifts, teaching gifts, or evangelistic gifts. Does that make sense? And this... This model uh, comes from a, a, a book and a teaching that Rebecca and I have been through called Church Life. And it's, it's just a way to kind of organize the church. And today we're going to learn about the, the, the role of the apostle and the apostolic gifts because it tends to be the one that kind of brings the other gifts together. Okay? So looking more specifically at just the apostleship, in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 28, which is just after it goes into great detail about the body of Christ and how we can't all be an eye or an ear, but yet you know, we need one another. You know, we honor those that are less honorable and those kind of things. We all work together as the church. It says this in verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, Okay, so those are some of the fivefold that we just mentioned. And just as I said, it said first apostles, meaning that the apostles tend to bring these gifts together. But then it goes into those individual spiritual gifts, not necessarily roles, like miracles and gifts of healing and helping and guidance, different kinds of tongues. And we can continue on with all the spiritual gifts that are mentioned, right? So... This idea that God gives us gifts, and that is both persons and spiritual gifts, and we all work together, um, is what we're going to be focusing on in this series called Christ's Gift to the Church. All right, so the gift of apostleship is kind of like which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, the apostles or the body of Christ, and then the apostles came and served them? I'm not sure. There's not really a right answer. 
right? Like, because we know that the sent apostles, we just studied the book of Acts, they started a lot of churches. Agreed? But on the other hand, we don't really know who started the church of Antioch. Like, it kind of just grew out of the persecution in Jerusalem. And then it says that Barnabas went and got Paul so they could teach in Antioch. So they, it's, there's not really a, a who came first. But we do know that there is verses like, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring, preach the gospel of peace, right? And so we understand that there, there, there must be a sending in order for there to be a gathering, So one definition for apostle is the spiritual gift apostleship is the defi- divine ability to start and oversee the development of new churches or ministry structures. But what does that, what does apostle really mean? Like, I, I have never, um, I, I've been a part of planting a church, okay, but I've never uh, started multiple ministries and, uh, and then been, been like a pastor to all those ministries. I, that, I believe that is what God has in store for me over my, the remainder of my career. Even if I have done that, we, I, I think all of you kind of know someone or have an opinion on is an apostle an appropriate title today? Um, I know of a couple of people who call themselves apostles, and, and that's kind of a, almost an affront at first. It's like, really? Are you, are you really an apostle? What does that mean? What are your credentials to be an apostle? Paul even addressed that in his writings. You know, Are you really an apostle? Did you walk with Jesus? Okay, so some of that comes from um, in the book of Acts chapter 1, when they have to replace Judas, um, Judas Iscariot. It says, um, therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of the re- resurrection. So there's like some understanding or um, maybe misbelief that apostles had to be living with Jesus. They had to witness his resurrection. And that, that has a scriptural basis here. But as we talk about the apostleship and the gift of apostles, we can't deny that God continues to give those gifts. If we, um, in fact, Paul himself recognizes this in the book of Acts 14 and also in 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4, he calls Barnabas and Apollos apostles as well. And they didn't know Jesus firsthand that we know of. We don't know if they were there for the resurrection, right? Right? And so even Paul was calling other people apostles. Now, sometimes because of the awkwardness of avoiding of of the word apostle, people will take on other titles, like global pastor is one that Scott Wilson uses, or um, uh, just coaching, just pastoral coaching. And so they might have 40 pastors that they meet with regularly, uh, you know, and they're counseling, coaching, mentoring, and that's an apostleship role, even if they don't call it apostles. But if somebody is operating as an apostle, then it's not, a, it's not a sin for them to call themselves an apostle. And in fact, I want to redefine for you what apostle actually means. The word apostle in the Greek actually just means a person that's been sent. Right? And... In order for someone to be sent, they first have to be called and equipped. And that's really kind of where um, apostles come in, is bringing in those different spiritual gifts so that people can recognize their calling, their identity, what God has put inside of them, and help to equip them so that they can be sent. I haven't uh, shown any of the gifts in this box yet. There really are gifts. Y'all haven't seemed very interested. Shall I, shall I reveal some of the gifts in this box? All right. Huh? You're being patient. You're being very patient. Well, since we had a, a picture with shoes on it, I brought some sandals because that tends to be kind of like, you know, the, 
historic representation of being sent with, you know, leather thong sandals or whatever. I don't have any of those. But these sandals have been to the Dead Sea. They've been in the Dead Sea, um, and so I, they're special to me. Um, that was a, a fun trip, but pro tip, don't put your face in the salty water because it will burn, okay? <laughs> but um, now, so we, we have been sent on, on a number of mission trips, and um, they've all been fulfilling and exciting, and we're going to have an informational meeting this Tuesday at what time? 7? 6.30? 6.30? We're going to be meeting to talk about a mission trip to Peru. And so if you're interested, even if you don't believe that you can make the trip, if you're interested in supporting us and finding out what we're going to be doing um, and praying for us, that would be awesome. And we're going to be partnering with a couple of other churches in order to make sure we have a sufficient sized team. And um, it's going to be ex exciting. The, uh, the gist of it is that we're going to be going into a mountain village um, not, f not far from Kuka. Cusco, which is the historic um, uh, capital of the Inca Empire. And um, we're going to be joining a medical team going into this village. They only get this medical team once a year. And uh, the whole, every, all the surrounding people of that village come out of the woodwork to come get some medical attention. And while they're there, we're going to be um, blessing them with um, activities like VBS style stuff for their kids and uh, praying for lots of people and uh, bringing things that we can bring materialistically to bless them and leading worship services and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be an awesome time. All right, so being sent. But we first must be called and equipped. And I just want to give a couple of examples of this, okay? Joseph knew from a very young age that he was called to be great, right? The dreams that he had received. But in order for him to get to that point, he had to go through... Uh, a lot of equipping, which came, unfortunately, through uh, being sold into slavery, uh, becoming a servant, going into prison, right? That was a, a, a desert period for him. But in that, he learned a lot of things. And, that, and he, he was developing that relationship with God, being obedient, um, having faith, uh, even in so far as interpreting dreams, and s learning wisdom. And God eventually sent him, even though he was just going back into Pharaoh's palace, sent him to become the leader of Egypt, essentially. Wow, how amazing. Same, similar stories. We can, we can think of Moses. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's palace, but yet he had to go spend 40 years in the desert shepherding sheep before he be received his, um, his actual calling to be sent back to Egypt and to speak to the Pharaoh. David had a similar time, right? David was consecrated, anointed by Samuel, but yet he spent 20 years, I think, uh, basically uh, going through his equipping process, trusting in the Lord, relying on the Lord before he was finally allowed to become king. Okay, Jesus. Jesus was, was baptized and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the dove came down and God annou announced to everyone, this is my son whom I'm well pleased, but yet he had to go into the desert for 40 days and be tested and tried to be equipped for the faith that he would eventually need to ex exhibit, to display that obedience that would be needed to go to the cross. And even Paul, Paul, of course, um, persecuted Christians, but then encountered Jesus. That was his calling. But then that from the time that he experienced Jesus in Acts 9 until he was sent by the church of Antioch in Acts 14, there was, um, Acts 11, there was 14 years there roughly. He went to Jerusalem, and he was so um, excited to be preaching the gospel that the other disciples realized, wow, you are putting your life at risk here. You need to go away for a while. He went to Tarsus for eight years, his hometown, to develop that relationship and that knowledge of, of who Jesus was because he didn't know that prior to Acts 9, right? And then it was Barnabas that said, hey, we got some exciting stuff happening in Antioch. Paul, would you come and join us? And he spent four years teaching in Antioch before finally the Holy Spirit said to them that it would be good for Paul and Barnabas to be sent on their first missionary journey. So there is a calling, there is equipping, and there is sending. And that's what the gift of apostleship, and that's what the role of apostles is all about. Okay? I'm 
I'm going to go ahead and open up one more, another gift here. So Rebecca and I, in the midst of COVID, um, while we were kind of in our, in our own personal desert, uh, we felt like we were supposed to start a church. We felt like God wanted us to stand in the gap and do more, not less, when so many other churches were, um, I would say, shrinking back and um, not being a strong presence of hope and of healing. And so during that COVID period, not only were we adopting Ginny, but we were, f- we were just listening and spending time with God and creating a vision. And that became Active Love Church. And at first, um, our, our sending church, uh, Waco First Assembly, they, uh, they blessed us and they made this very nice stole because I was receiving my license of ministry that time. And they, they recognized the calling of our life and they recognized that through that school of ministry that I was already in the process of doing and through the, uh, the time with God in, in our desert of COVID that um, there was a calling for us that we, it was time for us to be sent. And so that was a blessing that they gave us, and then the, the North Texas District Assembly of God um, a f- church planting director acknowledged that with um, this, this coin, which says that we were a part of the um, parent-affiliated church um, initiative to plant more churches, essentially. And so Christ gives the church gifts, and... To be honest, I was not super excited about being a pastor. <laughs> um, my, my, this, is, this cross comes from my dad, who passed away a couple years ago. Um, he was ordained as a pastor in 1965, and this was a gift that, he, that I, I believe the graduates of his seminary class received, was this cross. And so God has been working on me. In fact, I'm a fourth-generation pastor now. God has been working on me for a long, long time to become a pastor, but as I've discovered, I'm actually a pastor who has apostolic tendencies, okay? I, 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 I like to think about things in terms of gathering people together, of creating systems, of creating trainings, of creating methodologies, and so there are true pastors, and I would call Pastor Curtis a true pastor, where he is really gifted at focusing on the sheep, the, the, the shepherding of the sheep, of the compassion ministry. And then there are apostles who are are focused on on starting new things, right? And so we we balance each other well in that way. Um, And I have a lot to learn from Pastor Curtis in how to to pastor the people. Um, But also I think that I bring a lot in these apostolic gifts. And so each week, I'm going to ask someone who's gifted in these different areas to stand up and say, I'm a gift to you in the sense that I bring the apostolic gifts. But also, all of us are given gifts in each of those five areas. And we, together, are not only a blessing this way, but we're also a blessing that way, right? We need to use those gifts for the fulfillment of our mission. So, I would say that, making the analogy to Paul, that Waco was kind of like our Jerusalem, that that's uh, where we got planted in our ministry, Um, and then COVID was kind of like our our desert, our time away, and then where we were sent, uh, or where we got sent from was, hmm, how am I going to say this? I had it written out very nicely. McGregor is like our Antioch in the sense that this is our now our base. This is now our ministry. This is where we're going to be. But also there's going to be missionary efforts that go out in the surrounding communities, in surrounding countries. Okay? And so um, we have been sent to be, to be here. And God, when I have my personal reflection time with God, God says, you are my beloved son, and I have called you to be the leader of many. And I, I'm still learning what that means. I'm still learning how to do that. But 
I can't deny the calling. Amen? We're going to have uh, Kyle and Vicky t- next week talk about evangelism. And I know that they have gifts of evangelism. Even I don't know if they call themselves evangelists or not, but they, they're going to explain to us more about how we all have some gifts that are going to be useful in evangelism and how we have some role in the, the Great Commission. So from here forward, I'm going to be kind of focusing just, we're going to speed up a lot because I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to those that um, think they might have some, gift, some apostolic gifts and some apostolic calling. And they may not be in this room. My hope is that I can send this video out to people years from now and say, consider this, okay? But essentially what apostleship looks like is this, activating people in the kingdom of God, just like we're going to do over the next five weeks. And for apostleship, that means helping them understand who they are, their being, then equipping them or helping with their knowing so that they can be effective in their doing, which is doing the work of the ministry, and then completing that cycle with reflecting, having a culture of reflecting. Two weeks ago, the message, the title of the sermon was Your Identity in Christ. And so we focused a lot on who we are in Christ, that we are made righteous, and it's not by what we do, but it's by who we are in Christ, right? That makes us righteous. Then we moved on to who we are in our family and how our, our role in our atomic family helps to define, um, uh, just establish our, our relationships with others, okay? And then we talked a, a little bit about our role in the church. However, I kind of skipped over, it was really supposed to be a four-part series, our role in the church is largely dependent on our, our spiritual gifts. And that's what we're going to be exploring for the next five weeks, But then we went on to the fourth part of that message, which was our role as a church compared to the other churches. What what is distinctive about us? What is our mission statement? What are our core values? Okay, so that all that is tied together in the being. And we see this in like in Paul's relationship with Timothy. Time and time again, Paul Paul was affirming Timothy. You know, uh, fan into flame the the spiritual gifts that were put in with put within you. 1 Timothy 4.12, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for, your, for other believers in your speech and your actions, your conduct, your faith, and your purity. And so Paul is always reminding Timothy of who he was, who, he, who God has created him to be. But it doesn't stop there. If we look at especially the books of First and Second Timothy, we have a lot of instruction going on of Paul teaching Timothy, this is how to be the leader in your church. And, and Timothy moved around with him a little bit as well. He said, um, and, and if you just look at the first two chapters of Timothy 1, it, the, the chapter titles are Opposing False Teachers, Relying on Grace, Keeping the Faith, Instructions for Worship. It's kind of like he was lining out for Timothy. This is the things you need to know so that when you go and be the pastor or the apostle in your church, this is how you do it. And then for reflecting. Like I said, we're all learning and growing. And we have to have that attitude of um, accepting re- reproach. No, that's not the right word. Um, I wrote it down somewhere, but I can't find it. Admonishment, thank you. In Proverbs... 15, it says that, you know, we have, to, we have to be open to people's correction. And if we are, if we're wise in showing correction, then we're going to become wiser, right? And we are happy to receive that instruction. But if we're foolish, then it, it actually works against us. It says that we will end up hating ourselves if we're foolish and don't receive that, correct, that constructive criticism, that correction when it's provided, and so I'm always trying to work with people on how can I be better? Tell me what I did wrong. Okay? If I, ha- if I cause an offense, let me know. But we all need to have that attitude of reflecting. So an apostle is guided by values, driven by vision, obsessed with the mission, and they develop leaders and systems as they go. And I hope that you see that in everything that I've been doing over the last year. I've been continually reemphasizing our mission. Um, I have not m- emphasized the values and vision yet very much. Last week, we had a deep dive into our core values. Do you remember that? Or two weeks ago. 
We talked about what all of our core values are. And then along the way, develop leaders and systems to help those things be successful. And this, that can be visualized in this little diagram where on the far right, it says our vision is ahead of us. That's where we want to go. That's where we want to be as a people of God, both as a church and individually. Okay? Our core values are like that train tracks. The core values are things that we think are most important, the things we value the most. That's how we're going to make our decisions. That's how we're going to prioritize. That's how we get from where we are to where we want to be. Now, the mission isn't actually shown in this slide because the mission is kind of like the other side of the coin of vision. It's a two-sided coin, right? The, vision, the mission is kind of the need. We said our mission was the great commandment and the, and the great commission. The vision is how we're going to fulfill that need. It's the solution. Okay, so that's why there's, it doesn't show a mission up there, but they're really tied together. The, the engine and the wheels are all the things the church needs to become proficient at in order to move us along the track because the church is all in the back, the caboose or the, tr the, the Amtrak cars. Okay? And the thing that actually moves us, our fuel, is the Holy Spirit. All right, you'll receive power when you receive the Holy Spirit so that you can be my witnesses. So that's a pictorial of what the, an apostle is trying to accomplish within a church or within a, a ministry. Here's the guided by values. We looked at this in depth two weeks ago. If you missed two weeks ago, I really encourage you to go watch that online. We have it on our YouTube. Um, we're not going to go over this again today, but we will periodically reemphasize our core values. Our vision statement that we want to Lamp Ministries desires to create a missional community to redeem the world. We talked about what a missional community means, a, a, tr a, a spiritual community that highly desires to be effective in mission and effective in relationships. Okay, We have to do both or we're not going to be successful. And we have this acronym REDEEM, to reach other cities through small groups, through missions, and through multiplication. To demonstrate God's love to everyone around us, to expect members to continually grow and learn, and to meet the needs in the community in order to create opportunities to present Jesus. We're not just trying to do good deeds just for doing good deeds and earning up our treasures in heaven. We want to use those as opportunities to present the gospel, right? So that's our, that's our vision statement. This is what we adopted. The transition committee reviewed this. The, I'm sorry, the steering committee reviewed this. And then the, the body actually uh, saw this and voted on this. And what that looks like is a roadmap. This roadmap was put together in 2021 and has received very little changes. But we're coming up on 2024. What are the things in 2024 that we really look forward to? School engagement, well, we already kind of did that with um, Good News Club. Uh, we've also provided a lot of um, blessings to the teachers. We're going to continue that. We're going to strengthen that. Small groups, I really want to see small groups ministries become a bigger part of creating that um, relationship and creating an environment of inviting people into more than just Sunday morning. Um, the, as the 633 building gets to a, a more and more complete state, a state of readiness, we're going to have more community events here. I, I believe that. Uh, we already had a, a, a wedding come in and a community dance, so um, that's going to be fun. And then mission trips was something that will come up um, maybe annually, maybe biannually. Um, that's something that we want to do. So we talked about the mission Again, it's the Great Commission and the Great Commandment put together, and those boil down to four things. Praising God, loving each other, equipping our members, and reaching the lost. And if that's too many words, oops, we don't have it there. Praising, loving, equipping, and reaching. But in order to do those things, um, we need to develop leaders. We need to have leaders in the church. It's not just me. It's not just Pastor Curtis. And so uh, this is a, an eye chart. Right, and it's just to show that Rebecca and I, in our church planning process, we put thought to how do we move somebody from a first-time visitor, unsaved, all the way to someone that's ready to leave small, lead small groups or, or start a ministry. And so there's kind of a waterfall that happens there of training steps and 
mentoring that we want to do in order to prepare them for that. And so that's one of the things that I want to do is try to apply everybody into this so we can continue to improve. Um, developing leaders means identifying spiritual gifts. Y'all please help me to remember because at the end of today, we're going to take another spiritual gift assessment home. And um, we did this last year. Uh, participation was not super high, but I, I would really love to have these back sometime, okay? Because I want to see how, what are your strengths, not just your top one, but what are your top three or four strengths so that we can begin uh, figuring out if you're not already engaged in, in ministry, what are some areas that might be effective for you based on your spiritual gifts, your knowledge, your interests. Uh, apostles help to define success. We're not only interested in numbers. We're interested in obedience and faithfulness. So, 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 and then there will be reaping. Okay? And encouraging each other in that. Part of that reflection process is if we never see any reaping, then let's evaluate how we're sowing, right? Let's evaluate what we're doing to see if we can in increase that. Um, training is a big piece of so developing leaders. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm directing people to training whenever there's an inkling of interest because I believe that that activates us, that helps us um, become excited for that and, and learn practical things we can put into practice. Um, having mentoring relationships and then giving people progressive responsibility. How can we get you more involved? And, and um, I just want to give a quick example of that. On Thursday, we have prayer and praise every Thursday night, but Rebecca and I have, have been going to Ben's basketball games, which are sometimes on Thursdays. And um, Cecilia led on Thursday night, and I was I, I stayed in, um, and it was so beautiful. She did an amazing job leading people in worship and prayer. It was you know digital format. It was all YouTube worship, but the prayer time was excellent. You were here. The prayer time was excellent, and that was facilitated by Cecilia because that's on her heart, and we've been working towards that. And and um, so good stuff there. Um, Developing people, developing systems. Again, kind of two sides of the same coin. You can't, you can't have people operating without giving them some, um, some instruction, some, some guidance. So that church life model, which I showed you a very simplified um, pie chart earlier, it actually recommends 15 individual areas that the church needs to do well in in order to be maximize its potential. Okay? And that just gives us a framework that we can utilize for training, that we can utilize for suggesting ministries to people, getting people involved. Um, we use it to organize our, our Slack communication. We use it to organize our file system and Google Drive. Like it's just, it's been a helpful organization tool. But it, it actually mimics our mission statement. And this is what's beautiful about it. I know you can't see all the words. I'm sorry about that. The right two sides, we have, again, the spiritual life and the spiritual community, which represent the prophetic and the pastoral gifts. Those are helping to fulfill the great commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we are worshiping God through those pastoral, I'm sorry, through the prophetic gifts, and if we are loving one another through those pastoral gifts, then we are fulfilling the right side, which is the great commandments. But then the other part of our mission statement is the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have commanded you. Right? So that's the sending part. We have on the right side, the top is the evangelistic gifts, which they summarize as outreach and, and evangelism. And the bottom, we have ministries, which is the equipping side, which is the teaching. We need teachers to help equip us. And that those together fulfill the Great Commission. This is this is exciting stuff to me. In the corners we have the the fivefold ministry. In the middle is apostles. In the prophetic we have prophets. In the in the uh, spiritual life we have uh, pastors. In uh, the ministries we have teachers. And then in the uh, outreaches we have evangelists. So all of these things come together, and I want. Come on. Um, I, what, I, what I would love to do is, is find people, and these names really represent teams, 
people who are willing to gather teams around them of three or four other people to help fulfill each of those 15 parts of the church. And in those par- the, again, those areas are summarizations. So um, summarizations of the spiritual gifts. So what spiritual gifts specifically support the role of apostleship? Like I said, not all of you are apostles, but some of you may have some of these spiritual gifts, which might make you effective in some areas, such as church board, right? Being on the church board is an area of management and leadership, and you're not necessarily called to be an apostle, but you might have some of these gifts, like leadership, listed in Romans 12.8 as a spiritual gift. Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 has a lot of the spiritual gifts in them, um, lists administration, wisdom, discernment, faith, and then Romans 12 also has servanthood. So if you identify yourself as having some of these spiritual gifts, then as a pastor, I would say, okay, maybe you can help us manage our money. Maybe you can help us make good decisions, right? Maybe you can help us manage our facilities, um, whatever it is, lead a, lead a commission on something. Now, <laughs> Sometimes, I know most of us are retired here, but um, sometimes people in the workforce are, are utilizing their gifts and they don't even realize that they can be utilizing it for the Lord, right? Maybe they're um, doing really well at work. Uh, maybe they've been promoted to management. Maybe they have a really entrepreneurial spirit where they just love to try new things and see if it makes a profit. You know, they're not willing to take, they are willing to take risks. They are willing to work hard at their own expense. Um, they're not afraid of having a difficult conversation with somebody. And, b- and by n- nature, being optimistic and charismatic, that you know people love to follow charismatic people. Now, I'll admit to you that I kind of struggle with the last two, being optimistic and charismatic. I tend to see myself as a little more realistic, and uh, I'm not a very good people pleaser. I'm not very good at small talk. So uh, be forgiving with me in that. Help me on those two areas. But... Um, that's why I love to have my brothers and sisters who really excel in faith, like Jenny, like Janet, like Tura. You know, they just knock it out of you. They're like, don't talk like that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so if we, if we know people, particularly if we know people who are interested or curious about Jesus or interested in finding a church, and you can kind of, if you know a little bit about who they are outside of the church, you can, uh, you can already start to help us get them plugged in into a ministry that will just activate their spiritual gifts. So some of the training that I would recommend for someone who's interested in becoming um, a pastor or an apostle, um, and this is kind of generic, but um, serving on any ministry team, service is a huge part of uh, understanding who our calling is because, uh, you know, Jesus said, <laughs> I'm the greatest servant. You can't be greater than me, right? Um, and so uh, just serving in general, we want to believe in general that um, someone can serve on a ministry team even without necessarily being saved, okay? That doesn't mean we can have them be teaching bad theology. I didn't say that. But um, someone can come in and they can be serving in the church even before uh, they fully understand our doctrines, okay? Um, that we want someone to, be, uh, to then move into leading ministry teams, perhaps leading a small group. Um, there's something called the topical memory system, which is a great uh, bi- biblical memory uh, exercise that I benefited a lot from before I ever started any ministry training. Um, studying leadership materials, just listening to podcasts can really help um, ready somebody to become a leader of teams. Finding mentors, starting more official school of, of ministry training programs, and pursuing ordination. These are all things that kind of outlines my walk through life and how I got to where I am and things that I would recommend for others if they're interested in, in leading ministries. So just, that was a lot of words, I know, I know. Just imagine with me, okay, if we had every member of that fivefold ministry, all those giftings represented on our staff, and by staff I mean I, I, I hope that someday we can begin to include more people in part-time pay or even full-time pay um, so that we have uh, more people that are um, 
really dedicating solid hours into ministry, okay? Um, or on the board, if we have prophetic people on the board, right? If we have compassionate pastoral people on the board, if we have, you know, really creative people kind of in the prophetic realm, if we have people that are committed to missions and evangelism on the board, right? If we have those who really understand the importance of teaching and equipping on the board, then our board is going to be able to come to much, much better um, decisions on behalf of the church. Um, it might be harder to get to that c- conclusion, but uh, again, conflict is not bad. Conflict, uh, it, it engenders good decisions, it, the, get the best. Um, imagine if we had small groups in every, city, in every city around McGregor. If we had a group that met there once a week or maybe once a month, however the frequency it works out for them, and, in, and, and people that go to that small group, every week they're inviting one person to come join them. Right? Not at church, not at some foreboding place, not in another town, but right, right where those people are at. That would be amazing. Um, some of those churches might even grow up, I'm sorry, some of those small groups might even grow up and become their own churches someday. That's multiplication. That's multiplying our efforts so that it's not just what happens right here. Right? Um, We've st- many of us have stated many times that we would love to have some type of a transition home, a recovery house here in McGregor. Um, there have been multiple people just in the last year where um, they've come through and, and we tell them, you know, um, Rebecca helps lead a ministry called Hope House in Waco. It's for women. It, it, you, they could really help you, but it's in Waco. And then the response is, well, I can't. I don't really have transportation. I've got to be here for whatever reason, you know. If we had that ability to help people here, that would be awesome. Um, thriving ministries for all ages. We, we have an amazing children's ministry, midweek ministry, um, but uh, I would love to see that grow. I'd love to see uh, people of McGregor Junior High and High School, I would love to see every single one of them go through the 633 building at some point in the next few years and be like, that is a fun place and they are welcoming and they you know, if they're Christian, they, you know, they preach the gospel. And, and then finally, I'd just love to see people saved, you right? The more that we can appeal to people of different um, variety of interests through these different giftings, the more people we can save. And that's the bottom line. That's the Great Commission. So there are so many areas that we want to continue to serve. This, this flow chart... Uh, or organization chart that I put up here before, don't let that mislead you. There's a lot of empty boxes, and there's a lot of boxes that have the same name mentioned multiple times, and that's a recipe for burnout, okay? And there's boxes that are not even up here that should be up there. They're on this list, but not on this list. There's a lot of things that we want to do, want to be doing, and if you feel any kind of a calling, come talk to us, all right? So, um, Benjamin... Can you put on the ocean song, please? And this is what we're going to do for the remainder of our time together and uh, and for this song is um, we're going to pray. If you would like impartation of any of the spiritual gifts that we just talked about, where is those gifts at? I think it's time to change the batteries. Oh, I'm, I'm interfering with him, sorry. Um, if you would like impartation of any of these spiritual gifts, I'm going to ask you to come down during the song. We're going to lay hands. We're going to pray. And even if that's not you, I want you to pray right where you are. Just pray in faith. You can st- extend a hand. You can be praying that God would give the gifts that he promises us to give, right? What do I do with the box? There it is. He promises to give these gifts, Right? So say, more Jesus, more Jesus. We want more of these gifts. And then we'll come back and do our offering. I encourage you to pray out loud, pray in the Spirit, however God calls you to pray. And don't be afraid to come on down. Everybody stand, and thank you again for joining us today. And God... Uh, Thank you for blessing us. Um, Lord, you give us good gifts, and we're going to celebrate you all month long. 
And um, as you come across people, as you go through the checkout lines, I encourage you to be a blessing to others and remind them what Christmas is about. And you can just say Merry Christmas. And when they look at you funny, you can say, hey, it's the season. You know, it's all about Christ. So take advantage of the opportunity. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.